If you require transportation to Christchurch Cathedral for this afternoon's worship service and installation, please add your name to the list in the on-site office in the Gulf Islands B and C up one escalator ride. The rides leave here at 4 p.m. I just, I'm so technically savvy, I'm trying to find the, find the announcements here. There we go. Um, a people need to, people are asked to please abide by the shuttle time to which they've been assigned for departures tomorrow. Comments have been heard from some that they'll just jump on an earlier shuttle, but the vehicles have been arranged based on the flight schedules. Thank you. There is a list posted at the door and in the office. This is the 50th anniversary of another kind of shuttle that took off this morning. Some of you no doubt saw the news. Some of us are actually old enough to remember that day quite well. No, thank you, yes. Yeah, there's always some idiot in the crowd somewhere. Um, a reminder too that um, um, lanyards uh, can be handed in before you leave the hotel today, I think. I don't think you need your lanyard at the dinner, but you will need your tickets at the dinner. And your clickers, those clinkering clickers, need to be handed in as well at the desk, um, no, at the, in the office. Um, tablets, if you have them, go in the desk at the cloakroom right outside here. Uh, I think, yeah, I said that. Um, I think that's it for the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, we have a lot to get through, so we best hunker down. Uh, the, the private went to visit Melissa Skelton, and um, he should be back shortly. Um, so we have some business left over from this morning, one of which is the Jubilee Commission. And I believe we have Judith, you're coming, and Rosilla. Good afternoon. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to share the work of the uh, Jubilee Commission with you. My name is Judith Moses. I was elected as chair of this commission by my, my colleagues. I'm joined this afternoon by uh, Bishop Priscilla Shaw and um, uh, Bishop Isaiah Beardy. Our other colleagues on the commission are Reverend Pamela Raymond, uh, 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 Archdeacon Jim Boyles and Laverne Jacobs, and I hope that they are watching us on, on the live feed. We're a group of Indigenous and non-Indigenous uh, people. Uh, we recognize that uh, our task is enormous and that uh, the, the skill sets that we're going to need to do our work may not all be present, but um, we have committed to having a network of professional advisors to work with us, especially in the uh, finance and, and uh, investment fields. I would commend to you on your tables, you have postcards. Uh, you can see that uh, it's a modern design. We consider ourselves to be a modern commission. Uh, not all languages are yet uh, included. And uh, this is a work in progress. So if you think your, your language should be on this postcard, uh, please do let us know. We're going to start off. Bishop Beardy is going to talk a little bit to you about our mandate. Uh, the Jubilee Commission mandate. Reporting to the Council of General Senate, the Jubilee Commission, its charge, its charge to prepare a just, sustainable, and equi equitable funding base for the self-determining Indigenous 
Anglican Church. From Malachi chapter 3, verse 20. Put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. The focus of our Jubilee Commission work, uh, we've been asked to examine historic and current funds being made available for Indigenous ministries at various levels of the church's structure, assess current funds designated to Indigenous programming, and assess broader property questions. Some topics we've been asked to consider include current salary levels of Indigenous clergy and strategies to move towards parity, recognizing that many are non-stipendary. Possible redistribution of portions of property sales on a principled basis, and increasing alignment between funds for Indigenous ministry and Indigenous oversight of these funds. Our progress as a commission to date, we've met twice by Zoom conference call, worked on our guiding principles, clarified our mandate, have begun looking at historical and current trends, our focus is to be on the most pressing issues and opportunities for early progress, and our evolving work plan proposes a three-year time horizon. I'd like to share a word with you about the principle-based approach. We will adopt a shared principles approach as a foundation to guide our work. Our guiding principles are proposed in three areas. How we work together as a group, how we will structure our work, and how we approach and focus our work. On the first set of guiding principles, we thought it was very important to set out some ground rules for how, how we will work together. So we are an Indigenous and non-Indigenous um, uh, partnership uh, within the Anglican Church, and we're working on a shared mission to sustain the Indigenous ministry. And after the events here in the last few days, we are even more cognizant of uh, the importance of our mission and to uh, move our work forward as rapidly as we can. We, as a group, deliberate in a prayer-focused circle, and we're mindful that we are living in the faithful abundance of God. What that means to us is that we intend to consult broadly and opening openly and uh, to, to share our deliberations across the church. I should just mention we do have a, a website set up now and uh, it is our intention to uh, keep that up to date and make sure that um, you know what we're doing and if there is input from people uh, across the church that they have that opportunity as well. The third principle is to respect the UNDRIP principles, and I talked to you about those the other day, and we see those as forming the foundation of our work. We intend to be uh, ambitious, uh, creative, but also realistic in seeking solutions uh, for our new approaches and uh, the structures and, and processes that will, be, that will be necessary to support the Indigenous uh, Church. We intend to let indigenous ways uh, of doing things emerge um, by setting, trying to set aside uh, pre-colonial approaches. And that, that is not, not easy uh, to do. It, take, it does take a lot of standing back and, and questioning uh, our assumptions and, and values. Uh, but we're going to do the best that we can. And finally, we're going to be recommending options for a just proportion of the wealth of the church. The structure of our work, uh, research, work closely with dioceses to collect relevant information and data. Ask dioceses to identify a research contact to serve on a research subcommittee. Collect consistent comparable information across Canada. 
and then discovery build on existing and emerging models of support in Canada and elsewhere. Engage champions to help us brainstorm on options and future funding mortalities. Reporting and information sharing. Share information and insight on our dedicated webpage. Submit regular reports to the Council of General Senate. We'll work to identify approaches to supporting Indigenous ministries that are responsive to current and future needs, locally focused on Indigenous community needs and priorities, particularly Indigenous ministry areas, dioceses, We'll look to make them equitable across dioceses and sustainable into the future based on the engagement, empowerment, and stewardship of all Anglican communities. That's why this engages us all. We address the resource needs of all parts of Indigenous ministry under the Anglican Council of Indigenous Peoples guidance. We would like to address both the structure, how funding is organized and flows, and the magnitude of funding, all requirements for effective Indigenous ministry nationally and locally. We'd like to identify systemic solutions to the identified needs of already developed ministries, for example, the Indigenous Spiritual Ministry of Mashamaquish, Northern Manitoba, and Northern Saskatchewan. Recommend responsive new structures, models, and processes, not simply replicate past colonial approaches. Identify nimble models that can adjust to inevitable changes ahead in the body and in the life of the Anglican Church, and build credible business cases for moving forward. And a special shout out to our staff help from the National Church Office, Melanie Delva, our reconciliation animator. We are just getting started in our work, and uh, we haven't progressed too far just, just yet. We've only had two teleconference calls. But we, we uh, did spend some time trying to develop um, an initial work plan. And so uh, in terms of the next steps, I think the first one is to refine a work plan uh, and include within it uh, a rather comprehensive consultation strategy. We want to expand the Jubilee Commission website use and um, we will be relying on Megan Kilty and, and, and others to, to help us to, to do that. We need a network of people across the country to help us do the work. We recognize that we uh, cannot do that ourselves, and uh, we are hoping to identify diocesan research assistants who can help us to assemble the data and information that Bishop Beardy referred to. If there are other, any people in this room who have such an interest, please let us know. Uh, we want to identify uh, champions that will help us to, to move forward, and these may be one and the same, the same person. But the best way to move forward with change is to have people who really believe in what you're trying to do. And we're looking for those people to help us across the country. And then finally, we recognize that it, the, our priority, our top priority right now is to uh, look at a framework for divestiture of church properties. And that will proceed, um, uh, I think, rather urgently from, from, from our perspective. So, uh, we, uh, we are here not to vote on the Jubilee Commission going forward because we're already obviously in, in full operation, but I refer you to Resolution A181. Uh, be it resolved that General Synod affirm the creation of the Jubilee Commission by Council of General Synod uh, as adopted uh, at, uh, by the Council at its June 2018 meeting. I'd like to propose that resolution. It has been seconded, seconded by Bruce Myers, Bishop of Quebec. Thank you. That motion is before you, and that's on the no debate list. We'll use our clickers. Having. Um, Having formally uh, moved the motion, Judith, you still could speak, but are you okay now? Did you want to speak anymore? 
No, I think we've, we've, um, okay. we've, we've said everything that we need to say. Thank you. So, A for yes, B for no, C for abstain. Please vote. Has everyone had opportunity to vote? Voting is closed. You wanted to say something, Melanie? Oh, here's the results of the vote. That motion is carried. Madam Chair, uh, I had asked uh, the chair previous to you if I might have one moment. So if I could beg uh, the Synod's uh, patience for one moment. Um, Judith, I did not have the honor of knowing your mother. Uh, but I know that she loved our church. And one of the reasons I know that is uh, because I was gifted a medallion that she beaded with the Anglican Church of Canada crest in the middle. And as you go into your work as deputy prolocutor of this church, it is time for me to pass this to you. It's wrapped in, um, <laughs> it's wrapped in fabric from an Oneida elder uh, who gave it to me and said, uh, this is uh, to remind us of the three sisters. So I wrap it in that for you, and uh, I present this to you uh, humbly as I uh, appreciate and love um, you and appreciate the work that you are stepping into. It's a little like Bishop Mark's comment, I'm just the donkey, my mother was the one who went before me. <laughs> Our next motion is A030, that's not on your um, orders of the day, but it is one of the A motions that we needed uh, to um, deal with, and it's going to be the Chancellor will go speak. To yes, please. Madam Prolocutor, um, I move uh, that General Senate adopt Resolution A030. It's a resolution to give first reading to amend Section 11 of the Declaration of Principles to add a paragraph F as follows, and it's set out there, and that's to authorize the Handbook Committee to make such corrections and alterations to the Declaration of Principles, Constitution, and Canons as, and I, as it considers necessary, pro, provided that those changes are matters of form only, not of substance, and that they are reported back to General Senate, the next session of General Senate, which can set them aside by a majority. This provision is a very common provision in diocesan and provincial constitutions. We don't have one of those at the national level. So when the uh, handbook is created, uh, there various different uh, changes that need to be made that uh, can be quite cumbersome procedurally to have to do. And I'll give you one example. At the last General Synod, we changed the definition of Canadian forces to read Canadian armed forces, not substantive in any way, shape, or form, 
but because there are a couple references to that in both the Declaration of Principles and the Constitution, it couldn't be done. And so it, it, there's just some technical difficulties in doing things like that. In our canon for the election of a new primate, there's a typographical error in the uh, canon, in the procedures in Appendix A, that the clergy and lady shall sit on the left and the clergy shall sit on the right. Well, it, it's just that kind of thing that this is aimed at to give the power to do it. So I so move. The election's still counting. The election's just fine. Second. Linda, the election's just fine. <laughs> and that's seconded by Candle, Canon Randall Ferry. Um, and that's on the no debate list? Yes, and the threshold is a two-thirds majority in each of the orders because it's an amendment to the Declaration of Principles. Okay, so we'll vote by clicker. A for yes, B for no, C for abstain. Please vote. Has everybody had an opportunity to vote? Voting is closed. That motion is carried. Thank you. The next resolution we move on to is A070, which is the resolution to amend the rules of order and procedure. David? Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> Madam Prolocutor, I move resolution number A070, and it's, sent, and it's seconded by the, uh, by Canon Dr. Rand Randall Ferry, seeing as how you're in the chair. And the, this is to make some changes to the existing rules of order and procedure. They're of a fairly technical ma nature. Uh, for example, uh, in Rule 9, change the second edition of Kerr and King to read the most recent edition. The third edition is the one that's in print, but uh, and it's hard to find a second edition, and that's the one that's referred to. You have a third edition, Mr. Uh, Perry. That's a third, as opposed to the second, which is referred to. Um, and to change various other things, the, and a specific provision that this would not come into effect until the prorogation later this afternoon of General Senate, so it didn't affect anything that we did. Again, um, Madam Prolocutor, it's be, um, the threshold is two-thirds voting by orders at one session of General Senate. And it is on the no debate list, isn't it? Yes. Okay, that motion is before you. A for yes, B for no, C for abstain. Please vote. Has everybody had opportunity to vote? Okay, voting is closed.
That motion is carried. We have the resolution number 210, which is an amendment to resources for mission uh, coordinating committee terms of reference. It's moved by the Right Reverend Jeffrey Woodcroft and it's seconded by the Right Reverend Lynn McNaughton. Uh, it's on the no debate list, but the mover uh, has allowed three minutes to speak to it. Did you wish to speak to it, Bishop Woodcroft? <laughs> okay. Oh, hi. Uh, the uh, terms of reference for resources for mission have been uh, streamlined to make sure that the mandate of the coordinating committee can be met in, in the triennium. The purpose of all of this is just to ensure that we're doing our very best to support the work of General Synod and to resource dioceses whenever possible. Thank you. Um, so the vote, A for yes, B for no, C for abstain, please vote. Has everybody had opportunity to vote? Voting is closed. That motion is carried. Uh, we move now to the group of motions that you approved last night that they could come to before the Synod. The first one is C005, Constitutional Review. That's moved by the Reverend Monique Stone and seconded by the Reverend Canon Breth Bretsov. Monique, microphone too, sorry. Friends in Christ, over the duration of this General Synod, it has become apparent that we are in the midst of significant organizational change in our church. The most significant leadership change since 2007 the conclusion of a, of a strategic plan and the embarking on a new one, and the establishment of new structures. We have changes in our midst at a time when there seems to be much challenge, and yet a resounding hope that many are feeling here in this room. As organizations such as ours are faced with moments in which new phases are beginning, Unique windows open in which evaluation of existing systems, policy, and governance structures can, and some would say should, take place. These opportunities of evaluation enable us to either make necessary adaptive changes or to affirm that things are working effectively. The motion that is before you is a request for us as a body to invite COGS to evaluate whether the composition of the three orders at future general synods is effective for our future work as a church. It is an invitation to implement a process for this evaluation and review, to bring forward the results of this evaluation at General Synod 2022, and if deemed necessary, present changes for consideration. Evaluation and adapt adaptation are key traits of success for sustainable, responsible, and responsive organizations that honestly and authentically examine where they are in their current context and how they will move into the future. I think an acceptance of the motion before you is one way in which we can demonstrate our commitment to having these traits as integral components of who we are at this time a time in which our organizational integrity is examined by our members, our donors, and those who are watching from afar. I commend it to you. Thank you. 
Microphone number one. Uh, Madam Chair, um, I rise to move an amendment to this motion, which is seconded by Canon Ian Alexander. Okay. And it has been submitted to the Resolutions Committee. Okay. The um, proposed amendment that uh, Ian and I are making is to add just some words after the word membership. So that, sorry, I just got to find it on my phone. So that we would add, um, it would read, direct the Council of General Synod to review the composition of the membership, and this is the addition, and the rules and procedures governing the operation of General Synod, and bring forward any recommended changes. Rules of order and procedure, the Chancellor says. They're called the rules of order and procedure. Is that what you said? Yes. Yes. It's, okay. Yes. Okay. Um, we okay. didn't have the words of order, but we can actually add that if that's okay with the resolution. Yeah. Okay. Are we able to get uh, that proposed amendment on this, the words to that on the screen? Would you like them to be repeated? Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, that's correct. Procedures. Oh, procedure is singular, the Chancellor tells me. So, you see that amendment before you? Um, so, uh, speaking to the amendment. Could I make a point of order? If the mover and seconder of the original motion would agree to that, then we could skip voting on the amendment, couldn't we? Was that within our Chancellor? rules? Actually, you can't, the okay. Chancellor says. Okay, we can in our diocese, so. Okay. Thanks. So that it's been, it's been moved and seconded that we add and the rules of order and procedure to this uh, motion. That's the amendment that's moved. Any speaking to the amendment? All, okay, then I'll call question. All sorry, in favor? Sir, could, could I speak to the? Uh, oh, sorry. Could I speak to the amendment, as the mover? Of the amendment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very, very brief. Um, I think we're really. Uh, this is a great motion. I think it, one of the things that's going to come out of the synod, obviously, in the medium term, is looking at governance. I think, uh, in addition to looking at membership, and we support that, uh, look at uh, how the orders of the synod uh, can speak and how they can function. Uh, I think some of us have felt that. Uh, we haven't had the kind of mechanisms that we might need as order of clergy or order of laity to speak into the synod as the order of bishops has. So uh, a more fulsome review as what we're recommending by this amendment. Thank you. Any further speaking to the amendment? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, say nay. Nay. That's carried. Um, so now the motion is before you as amended. Be it resolved that this General Synod direct the Council of General Synod to review the composition of the membership and the rules of order and procedure of the General Synod and bring forward any recommended changes for consideration at 2020 General Synod. Uh, is there any speaking now to the amended motion? Microphone number two. Your, your grace, your grace to be uh, Madam Prolocutor, members of Senate. Um, I have no problems whatever in voting for this motion. It's just that I regard it as an example of repetitive tautology. I know that General Synod and the Council of General Synod are going to do strategic planning. Part of strategic planning I know from experience both in other places and on the Council of General Synod will be to have a look at our membership and our rules of order. You have just heard how the rules of order have been changed to meet modern times and to correct errors. The Synod that now meets is about two-thirds or less of the size of the one that was in 2007. This is an ongoing process. This merely reaffirms from the floor that we want 
Council of General Synod to do what Council of General Synod is going to do anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone number one. Uh, your, Madam Chancellor, Your Grace, and members of Synod, brothers and sisters, uh, I think I'm speaking against this motion, but I'm not ready to die on the hill. Mm -hmm. So just so you know, in case you want to take a shot. Uh, <laughs> but um, I have some concerns. Some of the talk I've been hearing in the last couple of days uh, seems to be possibly connected to this uh, concern in this motion. Uh, maybe I'm totally wrong. But like I say, even, even paranoids have real enemies, right? So I'm not sure. But we have to love them anyway. Uh, but I, uh, there's been a lot of uh, talk about the order of bishops in this process, and I think we have to remember that the uh, threshold was much higher in, for our major discussions, was much higher in the other two houses than in the, and in the House of Bishops, and uh, I've also heard some concern uh, that I don't share uh, from where some of those bishops are coming from and from what's perceived to be their votes on things. And I, I believe the bishops are an integral part of our church. They're uh, defenders of the faith by their uh, ordination vows. And I think that uh, anything we might be thinking about downplaying uh, their role in our synod would be a huge mistake. So take that for what it is. If it's, I think it's against the motion, but uh, I'm just giving that to, to the synod to chew on. Thank you. Thank you. Just before you step away, just I, I forgot to ask you to identify yourself. Uh, I thought I did. Sorry. Jerry Malski. And if Dice, you did, I'm, I apologize. Dice is a Frederick. Okay, thank no, you. I probably forgot. Thank you. Microphone number one. Um, Madam Prolocutor, uh, Your Grace, Ian Alexander, uh, Diocese of Islands and Inlets. Um, three quick points. I, I don't think that we would want to prejudge what the finding of any such review like this would be. Um, point number two, I think, however, that the intention of it is much more fundamental than the kind of housekeeping sort of changes that we were looking at earlier today. And, and third, and perhaps most important, um, when the mover and I were discussing this, we went back and looked at the two resolutions with regard to mission and strategy to see if, in fact, they, it, this was covered by them. And we did not feel, and obviously neither did the uh, mover and seconder of the main motion, uh, that, it, that it was. They are interrelated, but this is really flows from that. Uh, the, the, I, the way one thinks about these things is we start with the question why, we move to the question what, and then ultimately it's a question of how. This is the how part, and we're simply saying that as part of this review of everything that we are and do, that a review of synod membership and procedures uh, is an appropriate thing to do. Thank you. Microphone number two. Thank you. Uh, Bishop Rob Hardwick, Diocese of Coppell. This is just an observation. Uh, we did change the membership a few years ago, um, and it leads to an observation I have about the way the vote has gone at this General Synod. Um, bear with me. In the change of membership, many dioceses saw their clergy and laity numbers diminish by half. So we're two clergy less, two laity less. And in comparison, the major cities and centers across um, this nation of nations um, have seen a balance more towards how many Anglicans there are in Canada. And it's a justifi justifiable change. But across Canada, the only representative group, I think, is the order of bishops. And when I say representative group, I mean geographically. Now, there's a difference. We can take votes by our population strengths and um, by attendance at church, but the House of Bishop represents um, someone in all of those, that, and that order hasn't changed its representative rules. Some of our dioceses have five bishops, here, some have four, some have one. So there, there, there is 
we, we do need to look at this for all the orders, but I'm just saying the difficulty might be that some of those dioceses that have, uh, have voted no, or some of those bishops that have, we may have seen a different result at this general synod if more clergy and more laity were in the diocese where some of our geographical dioceses are. Am I making that clear? There's a, there's a difference in um, observation on the way we take votes. And if the Council of General Synod can bear in mind that we do need to be representative of all across Canada, I'll be much happier. But I don't like discussions like this at the end of Synod. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone number two. Alan Perry, Diocese of Edmonton. Um, I've been engaged in a process of visiting general synods around the communion to observe how they function, to watch how they work. Uh, I don't go with a message. I don't go particularly interested in the content of what they're just debating, frankly, just the process. I guess I'm a bit of a synod geek. I've been to nine different provinces, including Canada. Uh, I've got a, a tenth coming up in September. Let me tell you that representation and rules of order are all over the map across our communion. Uh, two weeks ago, I was at the uh, Hong Kong Sheng Kong Hui General Synod, and in that particular province, all of the clergy in the entire province of at least three years standing are members of the General Synod. That's one way of doing it. I think it would be impractical for us to do it here in Canada, not to mention prohibitively expensive. In uh, Iglois in Cymru, that is the uh, church in Wales, uh, they have particular representation of archdeacons. I'd be for that. <laughs> in the Episcopal Church, uh, they have equal representation for all dioceses, big dioceses, small dioceses, everybody gets the same number of representatives. And their youth don't vote, by the way. I wouldn't, I wouldn't advocate that here. I think the youth voting is a good thing here. But just a, a couple of different ways of doing things. There are probably 30 or 40 different ways of organizing synods. And it might be wise for us to learn from what others are doing and to ask, what do we need to do in our context? Not simply to import something from another context, uh, but to ask, you know, is, it, is there something that we can learn that would work here? Reviewing uh, our, our processes, reviewing our membership, reviewing our composition is not a scary thing. It's, it's perfectly fine. It's a normal thing. And I think it would be a very healthy thing for us to do. So I'm very much in favor of this motion as amended. Um, I, will be, I will do what I can to contribute to that review and to any drafting of any uh, proposals that might uh, emerge from that. I simply offer myself to do that. Uh, and, and so I would urge us to adopt this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone number two. Yeah, this is Caleb Sangmuir from the Arctic. So, I'm not a professional to um, describing the in the role of the justice or legal matters, but I have noticed in the last general senate, as a liberal and and the PC was was uh, fighting to each other in the last time. I noticing the liberal side was was participating a lot more, but the the other one progressive was not enough time, and also there was no the background. What's the reason why we we um, while we're dealing with the same sex marriage last time? There was not enough and including in the liberal um, government um, pieces site, and we never receive any, the background what we have to vote for. You know why? The, in the Eastern Arctic, the most of the con piracy was only speak Inuktitut, and those issues on the Constitution only written down in English. So we are Anglican, we are part, we are part of the Anglican Church in Canada, why 
why we so left out and never giving us the, in our language. So that's my point, and I what I like to see to changing the equality rights to both sides and liberal and and the other. And also, I guess and the Church of Canada have to be recognized that in the Arctic we are the largest diocese, the whole in the whole of the um, Anglican Church of Canada has to be recognized. We pay taxes, we're giving out the, the maybe about 75% of it to self-supporting and we get assist from the Council of the North. So it's better to be recognized. That it, you know, some of the issues we, um, we I'm seeing here, we are seem like a left out and we paid all the taxes and what we have to pay it and why there was nothing much of uh, that that we could be part of the Anglican Church of Canada to write them in, in our language. Thank you. Thank you. And I would remind people that we are uh, debating a resolution to review the composition of the membership. We were not doing that review. Thank you for that. Jane Alexander, Diocese of Edmonton. I, I would just like to support this, um, and for the reasons that everybody has, has expressed, because this isn't actually about, uh, per se, a vote that we've had at the Synod. This is a call to look at how we do what we do across all topics, including the issues of translation and preparation of materials, and then how we discuss things here, and if you can speak in, in your first language on the floor of Synod and have it translate. I mean, the whole thing, everything, how we function um, is, is part of a review. So I would ask people to see it in that light and not see it in terms of any particular vote that may have happened at this Synod, because I don't don't think that that is actually the underlying piece of this of this resolution. It's can we look at what we do and how we do it and make sure it's the way that is most effective for us. Thank you. Microphone number two. Uh, thank you. <coughs> uh, we are just asking COGS to review the composition. At this time, I'd like to call the question on this vote. Okay. Are we ready to vote? Um, A for yes, B for no, and C for abstain. Please vote. Has everybody had opportunity to vote? Voting is closed. That motion, that motion is carried.
Now, I'm aware our time is going quickly and we have some more business um, and I don't want anybody to feel that they can't speak to resolutions that they come to the floor, but I would ask you to keep that in mind, please. Um, we are, the orders of the day say uh, C004, but we're actually gonna go to C003 first. C003, which is moved by Bryn Blakey and seconded by Alexa Wallace. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of General Synod. My name is Bryn Blakey from the Diocese of Rupert's Land. As Anglicans, our baptismal covenant asks us, will you strive to safeguard the integrity of God's creation and respect, sustain, and renew the life of the earth? I do. Once again, our fifth mark of mission reminds us to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. We as Anglicans are called into the stewardship of creation. And that creation is very much at risk. There are continuous outflows of scientific evidence that climate change is real. It is here, and it will not wait for anyone. And that's why we have to act, and we have to act now. The resolution I'm speaking to is brought forward by all the youth at General Synod. And so wherever they are, I ask them to stand in their spots and keep standing. Now, the day before General Synod started, we all met and we had a serious discussion about climate change, and we all recognized that it was a serious issue that we were all passionate about. So I won't go into the nitty-gritty details of climate change, but I did tweet a link to a video with hashtag GS2019. I encourage everyone to watch it. It's a three-minute video. Uh, but uh, I, along with every youth standing here, throughout the floor, we asked General Synod members to consider four items in this resolution. The first, we ask that the church recognize climate change as a climate emergency. Second, to help us stop climate change from advancing any further, we need to prioritize the baptismal covenant and our fifth mark of mission within our faith in day-to-day -day life. Now, we can do this uh, through various different activities from uh, cutting out single-use plastics, as we already agreed upon the Synod, to reducing emissions where possible in hopes that uh, we can put an emphasis on finding renewable sources. We can also simply just support our local green spaces. Now, our third item asks everyone to collaborate with our fellow Canadian faith communities so that we can move forward speaking on this issue with one voice. Lastly, uh, we urge the public witness for Social and Ecological Justice Committee to continue doing their best to make future meetings within the church as sustainable as they can. Uh, we would like to put an emphasis on looking into a carbon offset, because as we know, most of us flew here, and we can't avoid that, um, but that would be a great way to try and reduce emissions somewhere else. Now, what we are asking can be a lot, and it can be challenging, and it will take time. So I urge everyone to just take a moment to know what you're committing to, um, but I do urge everyone to say yes to this vote. Thank you. Thank you. And feel free to sit, youth. Any speaking to the resolution? Are we ready to vote? Yes. We're going to uh, do this by, uh, oh, sorry. Microphone number two. <clears throat> Paralysis, um, Lily Bell, um, Reverend um, Lily Bell from Haida Gwaii. I'm in favor of this because I come from where our main source of food is salmon. And we, this year there was um, hardly any salmon when I left. And that's our main source of food. And it was because there was not enough rain and the rivers um, weren't filling up and the water was too warm for the salmon to return. So I'm happy for this um, motion. Hello. Thank you. Alexa. Microphone two. 
Madam Chair, if, I start, if you start with that, do I still have to introduce myself? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, my name's Alexa Wallace, Diocese of Saskatoon. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, Your Grace. You'll get mad at me if I take the microphone out, I bet. Um, I wanted to make this clear that this is the youth of Synod bringing this, but it is not just because we decided procedure at Synod is a lot of fun and wanted to make our own motions. <laughs> Though we did decide procedure at Synod is a lot of fun. <laughs> Um, more so, many of us have backgrounds in science or environmental justice. We come from about 25 dioceses in Canada and we see the effects of climate change in every one of them. And it doesn't matter if you come from the middle of a farming community like I do or the middle of the oil sands like other youth delegates here do. We have made this motion because as much as we are referred to as the future of the church, we are also the church and part of the world now, and we are deeply concerned for what, where we are leaving the world at for ourselves, for our children, and for our grandchildren. With that, I would strongly urge you to support this motion, not because it is being brought by the youth of the church, but because the youth are bringing it out of fear for their future. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone number two. Every time when I go to South, microphone always high. I don't know me too. I'm an elder of Senate in 2019 and also from Diocese, to, uh, Diocese of the Arctic. I'm from Inuk York, Northern Quebec. I really support for climate change, it really affects us so much. There's many people rely on, on the land. And also we got wrestle with the world. In the world they said the polar bear is they said, declining. And there's many fake news or fake photos about the polar bears. Polar bears are mammal and at the same time, it's, it's a mammal. They live in the water and ice. I really, to, I really want to get support. There are so many hunters up there losing their machine and they're losing the life because the ice is not that thick anymore. And they cannot even predict the weather. If you go up to the north, you won't see any forecast in written. But you have to know what you see. That's unpredictable now because of the climate change. It's very vulnerable right now. We should really work together. The world doesn't understand what's going on, especially for the animals. There's oil companies that's blasting on the water up in where, where we are. All little things that we cannot see, they eat it under the sea. I really support climate change should be enforced or give a voice to the North. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, we're, gonna, we're not gonna use clickers for this one. I will simply do an audible vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. Now we. We have other business we have to get to. Um, these are C motions. Uh, they, they will be referred to the Council of General Synod unless we get time at, which I don't see how we're going to at the end. Um, but we will move now to a report from the uh, meeting of the Anglican Consultative Council. I would ask uh, 
Jane Alexander and Bork and John Kofwanka, if you would come to the presentation stage, please. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, is the microphone in the right place? Good, okay. My name is Anne Burke. I am the lay member of the Anglican Consultative Council from Canada, together with Bishop Jane as our Episcopal member and the Reverend David Burroughs as the clergy member. This was my first ACC meeting of three to which I have been elected and I have some general reflections to share. It's confusing, yes, that the acronym for the Consultative Council is the same as for our national church, ACC. Hong Kong, a place with over 7,000 skyscrapers in 31 square miles with not an inch of space in between. A fascinating place, if only we had had time to see more of it. But we were gathered about 110 delegates from 40 provinces, representing about 160 countries, apparently. I'll just make a quick sidebar here. You may not quite appreciate this, but this was, in fact, our Thursdays in black. It seems like a few people didn't quite get the plot. <laughs> they do like their pink shirts. No, no disrespect there. <laughs> During Holy Week, while still at home in Ottawa, I realized something powerful about the Consultative Council, which came true for me when we all gathered in Hong Kong. We met together for the start of ACC 17 in Easter week, a few days after celebrating the resurrection at our glorious Easter Sunday services in all our countries. It was for me a visible expression of the body of Christ the growth of the faith from the center where it started to all around the world. More than 2,000 years on, and there we all were, the faith still strong. As a lay member of the ACC, my reflections are probably slightly different from those of Bishop Jane and of David Burroughs. And by the way, David Burroughs is not able to be here, unfortunately. The opening Eucharist was held in St. John's Cathedral in Hong Kong Island a beautiful cathedral packed with not only ACC people, but with many locals as well. In, the formal, in formally opening the meeting, the Archbishop of Canterbury sounded a Chinese traditional ceremonial gong, which had been brought in for the purpose. Unexpected as it was, except for a tiny one line and small font in the order of service, most of us were startled by the immense noise of the gong. The archbishop had wound up as if pitching baseball and hit the gong full force. The delegate sitting next to me quite literally clutched his chest and sat down. <laughs> the accommodations and the hospitality of Archbishop Paul Kwong and the province of Hong Kong Shen Kung Hui were outstanding and generous beyond our imagination. We were hosted to banquets and dinners, and there was everything we could want or need at the hotel where we stayed, and where all of the main business sessions were held. S staff from the Anglican Communion Office in London and from Lambeth Palace were present throughout the meeting and had achieved a very well-organized and well-run meeting with the ample assistance of many local Hong Kong Anglicans. The director for mission from the ACO, the Reverend Canon John Kafwanka, was present in Hong Kong, and we have been delighted to see him here at our General Synod in Vancouver. Thank you for joining us, John. The business sessions were very tightly packed, with no free time any day, including four worship services a day, plus table Bible studies. Many of us went to the 8 a.m. morning prayer. We all went to noon Eucharist. Many went to, to 5.30 evening prayer. 
And I have no idea how many people went to 10 p.m. Compline because I never made it there. By that time, I was already very tired. But the daily noon Eucharist was one of the highlights of the meeting, with teams representing different regions of the communion participating in the service each day. Bishop Jane and I were asked to participate on the first business day. I th Can we go back? Uh, no, back one to Jane. Could we go back one to Jane? Yeah, thank you. There's Bishop Jane. And then, and then the next one is me reading. Yes, thank you very much. While the liturgy was familiar to all of us, the cultural differences were beautiful to see. One gentleman from India who came barefoot on his knees to receive the communion, while a lady from Myanmar covered her head at that time. All one through common beliefs, but expressed in our different cultures. Bishop Jane will speak about some of the substantive issues which were presented at ACC 17. One of the most interesting to me uh, was the Safe Church Commission, which you have also seen presented here at General Synod. Much work has been done by the Commission since it was set up following the previous ACC meeting, and it provides valuable tools which all provinces are asked to consider adopting and implementing. The work of the Commission over the next three years before ACC 18 will be in part to produce template forms for implementation of the guidelines, which will also be available throughout the Communion. In personal discussions with the Chair of the Commission, Mr. Garth Blake from Australia, I was pleased to, to make the connection for him to our insurance company in Canada, Ecclesiastical Insurance, whom you've seen upstairs and who are very generous to us, who have done considerable work in this area with both our church and the Catholic Church. This connection was made within the first week of returning from Hong Kong, and I'm pleased to hear that a meeting has already taken place in Australia between the two parties, and with thanks to Ecclesiastical Insurance for making this happen. This was the first ACC meeting with youth members, and they brought a refreshing voice to the whole. Their passion for their roles within the church is infectious. One of them was elected to the ACC Standing Committee in her own right, not as a token youth member. They are passionate about environmental issues and came suitably attired in green t-shirts uh, at the formal group photo day with the Archbishop of Canterbury. The youth members made a presentation at the network session about the International Anglican Youth Network. Their presenter specifically asked me afterwards if I would make a connection uh, for them to the appropriate person in Canada, as there were no Canadian youth in the network by that time. I'm pleased to say this connection has now been made with Sheila McGlynn, our national youth animator. One of the youth members at my table group was a young Australian woman, formerly from Myanmar, of the Karen people, whose family arrived in Australia when she was 19, at a time when thousands of the Karen people were refugees fleeing Myanmar. She is now an ordained priest of two years. The other youth member was a Maori man, uh, a youth member, yes, who shows a beautiful piece of artwork all down his right arm, which he told us is his tribal identity. He spoke of his work and life in the indigenous church in New Zealand. It was a joy to meet both these youth members. I mentioned table groups earlier. Two weeks before the meeting, Bishop Jane had communicated with both David Burroughs and me, and amongst other things, just mentioned it would be nice to take some small gifts for each person at our table groups. Okay then, what to take? Um, it helps having been around the National Church for many years, as I suddenly thought of the wonderful Hope Bears from the Anglican Foundation. No, not the full-size teddy bears, but the mini ones on key rings, which some of you have probably picked up from upstairs from the Foundation um, booth. I emailed the Foundation Executive Director, the Reverend Canon Dr. Judy Royce, who well knows that Hope Bear is one of my favorite parts of the Anglican Foundation. Within one day, I received by express delivery one package of 15 of these beautiful little guys. Thank you, Judy, they were perfect. On the first day, when I looked around my table group of eight men and two women, including two primates, 
a scattering of the reverend doctor learned types, two youth members and me, I thought, they'll think I'm mad giving them teddy bears. But no, not at all. They were all delighted. And one of the primates even said, I have grandchildren, but they're not getting this. This one is mine. <laughs> it was also a good opportunity to tell them briefly about the Anglican Foundation of Canada. For me, it was an extraordinary experience to be at the Anglican Consultative Council. The ACC is the only instrument of communion with lay members, and to realize that we were all there with equal voice was quite powerful. Were there difficult times? Of course they were. We're a body of human beings whom God has called into service in the church one way or another. So there were bound to be some differences both in the plenary sessions and at our table groups. But by the grace of God, things were settled in some form or another. The connections which one makes at ACC are also unique and valuable. In addition to the ones I have already mentioned, I had the opportunity to meet the Bishop at Lambeth, who is also the Bishop to the Armed Forces in England. As I have the privilege of being Chancellor to the Military Ordinariate of the Anglican Church of Canada, it was a good opportunity to meet another civilian who works with and around one of the smallest clubs in the world, Anglican Military Bishops. I think there are five. And I have recently discovered, since I was here uh, in Vancouver, that Bishop Quito, usually found in the corner over there somewhere, um, from New Zealand, whom I also met in Hong Kong, is also the bishop to the New Zealand Defense Force. So half of that tiny club is already present in this room. <laughs> I returned to Canada understanding more about our own beloved church. I had never worked in the international forum of the church before and reports of work from various places were often just that, interesting but somehow a bit disjointed. How did we actually fit and function within the communion? I learned much. Having now been in the international community, I can more easily see how networks function, how some countries do the work on the ground, while maybe other countries coordinate resources or provide funding. We can and do work together. I am grateful for the opportunity which was given to me when I was elected lay member for Canada. To me, the strength of the Anglican communion is not when we dwell on our differences, but when we work together with, on issues with which most people can agree, such as the environment, human trafficking, safe church, education, clean water, you know the list, it goes on. As a first timer, there was much for me to learn and much to continue absorbing and contemplating in the months and years to come. The next ACC meeting is in 2022 in West Africa. So, thank you for listening. I would like now to hand over to Bishop Jane. Hello again. Um, I will cut down what I was going to say because I realize that time is at a huge premium. So I'd just like to say just a very few things and I promise to speak very quickly. So, um, that probably means that it will all be completely unintelligible, so apologies, here we go. Um, I do have the honor of being the Bishop Rep on ACC and a member of the Standing Committee of the Anglican Consultative Council and also part of the Jesus Shaped Life Group which is involved in working with intentional discipleship. And although that is my main passion, uh, John Kafanka is going to speak about that which makes me happy and sad at the same time. <laughs> all right, the first thing I want to say to you is the regular plea that please, please, can we all educate ourselves more on the work of the Anglican Communion, the networks, the Consultative Council, and please hold the Consultative Council in as much regard and with as much respect as the Lambeth Conference, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Primates Meeting, because it is an instrument of unity and it's usually the one that is ignored, shoved off to the side, and the resolutions that it pass are not, passes are not known among the church as a whole. And that is a shame. It's a shame for so many reasons, not the least of which is that out of all the instruments, it is the only one that has lay and clerical non-bishop um, people present. So please from one general synod, which is composed that way, 
to an instrument of unity in the communion which is composed that way. Let's find out more about how we work and what we do. Wonderful things were spoken and shared about how we live out our discipleship. Archbishop Justin Welby said, when I look at the millions of Anglicans around the world serving faithfully as disciples of Christ in communion with one another and the wonderful, miraculous work they do, I cannot help but see God's great plan at work in the world. Powerful stuff. We committed ourselves to living a more Jesus-shaped life. We heard from the Anglican Communion Office at the United Nations offices in New York and Geneva, and we heard how important those offices were. All of the resolutions that I will briefly skate over, and I'm not going to skate over many of them, so don't worry, um, they're all available on the Communion website. Please do have a look and have a look at the resources. We heard of incredible responses around the communion in times of natural disasters. We heard a lot about how poverty and climate change go together. I commend to you A1706 and A1705 that deal with those um, pieces of work. I commend to you the work of the Anglican Alliance, particularly around responding to the most vulnerable people in society and building a sustainable world. For us, look at the connection between what we're doing around the issue of human trafficking and what is happening with the Anglican Alliance, please. In ecumenical matters, the communion in their ecumenical vision for how we are united as the church in the world, we, went to, we did a, a remarkable thing. It might not feel remarkable to you, but it was remarkable because the ACC is now the body which will receive ecumenical texts in the communion and form a reference group for how we respond as a communion to these conversations we have. So that will be done in three-year periods instead of the 10-year periods between Lambeths. So we might actually do a little more on a local level with the work that's happening. But I will also tell you of a sad thing that happened because I'm not going to stand here with my rosy spectacles on and tell you that everything was wonderful because it was not. A motion came that asked for the full implementation of something from Lambeth 1998, which is a very long time ago now, which called for a listening process across the communion with those who had felt marginalized because of their sexuality. And the original motion that came asked for the Consultative Council, according to our own code of conduct, to respect the dignity of every person as children of God and that they should be fully included in the life of the church. If you can believe it, we debated the word fully. And then we debated the word included. And then it came back as fully welcomed. And we debated the word fully. And we debated the word welcomed. At that point, my heart broke as I saw our baptismal covenant crumble in front of my eyes. If that is something that you would disagree with, I encourage you to write to the standing committee. If you would like that to be affirmed, I encourage you to write. I'll give you a stamp. But it's something that when we gather as an instrument of unity, we have to proclaim that all people are God's children, welcome and loved in the church of God. So we did wonderful things and we were tightly controlled and we didn't have much time to talk. And so it meant that when we did get time to talk, we didn't have time to resolve things as best as we could. The resolution that we came to and the fact that two bishops on very opposite sides could hug each other and find common ground was due to, I think, I believe, their relationship through the consultation of bishops in dialogue of which this church was foundational. And those two bishops could come together because of the relationship they already had and speak together. So, oh, I'm just a harbinger of doom again, aren't I? But I want to be honest in that in the world, People need to hear that they are loved and made in the image of God, irrespective, irrespective of where you live, how you live out your faith, and what your sexual orientation is. So now, my favorite piece of the work, which was around Jesus-shaped life, I will hand over to someone else, and that is my friend and colleague, John Kofwanka.
uh, Primate and uh, Chair, uh, Madam Prosecutor, and the, uh, the House, I want to say how grateful I am for uh, the invitation for me to be here and to journey with you over this uh, past, over this week of your meeting here. And I just want to mention, because I'm speaking for the first time, that I bring greetings uh, from uh, the Secretary General of the Anglican Communion Office, uh, of the Anglican Communion, and indeed the staff of the Anglican Communion Office. Uh, no doubt your sisters and brothers across the Communion uh, have been journeying with you uh, during this period. Um, the Anglican Church in Canada, of course, is widely and intensely connected across uh, the Communion uh, through many companion link dioceses that exist, uh, the various ways that you engage in the networks and commissions of the Communion, uh, the SEC we, have just, uh, we are still talking about, and various other ways. We have also seconded staff to the Anglican Communion Office. Uh, recently, of course, uh, they just, you just left uh, a fine and uh, son of this country, uh, Canon uh, John Jibo, has been a colleague and staff at the Anglican Communion Office, and we miss him now. He's left, he's come back here. No doubt you have received him well, but we miss him uh, um, back uh, in London. But simply to say how grateful I am for me to be here, and it's a great honor uh, to be uh, here at this time. Um, the theme for the um, the theme for the SEC uh, was equipping God's people going deeper in intentional discipleship. Uh, this was um, a carryover of the theme of the previous uh, SEC, uh, which took place uh, in 2016 in Lusaka, Zambia, uh, whose theme was uh, uh, intentional discipleship in a world of differences. And so SEC decided, um, indeed through the standing committee, that we continue with the theme. And so I'm going to play a very short video, just uh, which video was played at the SEC, and so that... Uh, uh, although it doesn't give uh, every detail in terms of what you may understand about what this journey, uh, the communion is about, but I'll say a little bit later on that. But just uh, let us listen to, uh, to this video. Hello, my name is John Kafankanda, I work as Director for Mission in the Anglican Communion. We all know that Jesus urged his followers to make disciples of all nations. The Great Commission itself is at the very heart of the work that we do. In 2015, the Standing Committee agreed to make intentional discipleship the main theme for the SEC in 2016 in Lusaka, as Archbishop Justin explains. At the Anglican Consultative Conference in uh, 2016, they called for every province, diocese, and parish in the Anglican Communion to adopt a clear focus on intentional discipleship and to produce resources to equip and enable the whole church to be effective in making new disciples of Jesus Christ. I really want to endorse that call very, very strongly indeed. It's uh, the most exciting thing we do as Christians is to bring other people to Christ. SC16 was the launch pad for the season of intentional discipleship in the Anglican Communion. And some of the provinces we are so quick to get started. Our province uh, moved quickly because I think God was already working within us. Uh, and we, he was calling us to respond to what he was up to here. In one synod, we decided that we needed to realign our vision and mission statement. And our vision and mission statement also was intentional in placing Christ first, anchored in the love of Christ, transformed by the Holy Spirit, and committed to God's mission. Already we're saying, as a province, we, want, we wanted to realign. And then our missional priorities also reflected what I would call eight intentional program and processes that said we will disciple uh, the province uh, uh, in this way. Since SEC 16, I've had wonderful opportunities to travel around the communion, supporting leaders in their involvement in this vision of intelligent discipleship. It's been amazing to see how many churches are getting involved on this journey. As the work of this season of intelligent discipleship has grown, last year we had to appoint Reverend Jolion Tricky to coordinate this work. 
It's been wonderful to see how the season of intentional discipleship is capturing people's imaginations all over the world. We've seen this in places from Mexico to Malawi, from the UK to the Philippines, from New Zealand to Jamaica. Good afternoon, my name is Julio Murray. I'm the primate for the Anglican Church in the Central American region, Yarka. We have embraced the intentional discipleship because we see that it's a step in the right direction for mission and ministry. The initiative coming from the Anglican community is also a tremendous opportunity because we can share different styles and ways in which we can be disciples for Jesus Christ in the context in which we are. I hope and pray that many other primates in many other provinces are also looking for opportunities to become part of this tremendous movement because that is not only what the church needs, it is also what God wants for us, an intentional discipleship. I realized that the most important thing was that discipleship is whole of life. It's, it's somebody sharing their whole of life with you and you sharing your whole of life with them and because together we share the whole of the life of God. So that for me, I felt like once I started to be on a very strong intentional discipleship journey, it was a little bit like the English saying was like kind of putting my hiking boots on um, to go up the hill. You just got so much more traction, that rhythm of accountability of what is God saying to me and what are we going to do about it? And that's been the phrase that we've just kept using within our churches. A disciple is somebody who knows how God is speaking to them and then knows how they're going to respond. Um, so that Jesus-shaped life becomes part of our life and that's been the most remarkable part of um, my experience of discipleship is knowing how to live more deeply in the spirit of Jesus and how to follow him more deeply and you just have to do that in community, you have to do that one-on-one -on -one with people. This season of intentional discipleship is growing and continuing. Many resources are being developed, are being gathered, are being shared across the communion and the word is spreading. In fact, it is a, it is a tool we, I think it is God sent. This intentional discipleship is God sent into the Anglican communion. And the tools that we have acquired, the, it, it is a way of empowering us for effective ministry, holistic ministry, I can say, starting from discipling the family, discipling uh, the church, discipling, the community discipling the nation and so on and so forth. And it, it cuts across from Sunday school children to the youth to adults and in all aspects of our lives. So that's why they call it whole life discipleship. Workplace, marketplace, wherever you may go, you must first be able to uh, disciple people around you and collectively by God's grace evangelize the whole world. Jesus began the movement, uh, revolutionary movement, um, most uh, revolutionary movement in all of human history, a movement grounded in the unconditional love of God for the world, and a movement mandating people to live that love. And in so doing, to change not only the lives that, but the very life of, of the world itself. I mean, as you can see, of course, that quote comes from uh, the PB, um, Michael Curry. Um, this is exactly how we live. Uh, we had in terms of uh, reference to but Archbishop of Canterbury in his address at, uh, at ACC. But this is how many of our churches here in Canada and across the world uh, that you live, uh, you live that out, you live that faith um, in everyday experience as a movement of people who are endowed with that love uh, to share in the world. But I think it's also true to say that uh, a number of leaders have said in a number of places that uh, um, we, there is a lot that is going on and that what we, what we are doing, how we are living that out, but also we sense, we've, we see the gaps within ourselves. We see the gaps in terms of the difference between professed faith and the lived experience in our communities, 
deficiencies, sometimes that you, people would say Christian life and practice, sometimes deficiencies that is, comes across in the lack of confidence among ourselves and within us, uh, sometimes uh, too much emphasis on clerical, on my color and those people of color, and putting a lot of resources within there, and leaving out particularly in terms of resourcing uh, the people that are on the front line seven days a week, and in terms of how they can be and they grow as disciples in their workplaces, in their, every aspect of life. And the decline and nominalism, uh, I tend to question myself and tend to say that uh, most of these things are there, and we can see them as reasons for some of the things that we, we experience. Are, but I think I also ask, are these not simply symptoms of the challenges indeed that actually we face? And what is it that actually uh, that we, uh, we, should, we are grappling with? This is what Archbishop Justin said, um, that the absence of any real emphasis upon uh, discipleship in England in the 30s and the 40s and 50s um, had a profound impact on the decline that we experience today. He was basically stating the fact that, uh, of course, there will be various other reasons, and many people, and he was the first to acknowledge, there are various other reasons that has led to where, in terms of the decline that we saw and continue to see. In fact, a report that came very recently last week uh, said that uh, the attendance in terms of church attendance in the whole of the United Kingdom has gone even lower uh, in comparison uh, in, the last, uh, in, the last, in the last few years, that the attendance is lower and in fact the, um, uh, the, the non-going, uh, not just the non-going people, but those actually who are no faith at all, the numbers are on the increase. And many people actually are asking, do what, what, what should, should there be a place for Christi Christianity and Christian faith in the public square when in fact its relevance is gone. So those are some of the questions people are asking today. But these are the challenges that we have to grapple with, and sometimes how we respond to that, uh, if we respond to that simply in terms of uh, we make a simple arrangements within the way uh, we do things and thinking we are, we are simply sometimes this is a symptom, but we need to look at what are the underlying issues. And I think this is where intentional discipleship and Jesus shaped life, it's trying to address the underlying issues rather than simply addressing the symptoms that are, are on there. And so what this is about in terms of when we talk about intentional discipleship, we talk about living and sharing Jesus shaped life. What does this mean? This means basically it's about wholeness of life. It's about every aspect of life. It's about our career, it's our occupation, our job, our profession. And many times we have relegated these uh, in the context of this is secular. And we, we have divided the world into secular and religious. And so if I'm in a place, I'm in a secular environment, therefore my faith doesn't actually matter in there. And I think this is what he's trying to address is that in fact, that is not where we are. Where we are is to see how faith becomes live in this context, in terms of creation, in terms of our life from Monday to Sunday, and indeed in terms of the person, it's about the whole person. Um, again, in terms of people, it's about the whole person of God, it's the whole people of God. It's about young people, it's about lay, it's about ordained, it's about men, it's about children, it's about the whole people. I get sometimes very uncomfortable when people, we talk about the church is not doing that, the church is not doing that. And a number of us do say that, and even, even much more uncomfortable for me is when us clergy with cola, we talk about the church is not doing that, the church is not doing that. And I kept asking, who the hell is the church? Who can be the church if we are not the church? You know, we, and oftentimes when we say that we're actually referring to either the archbishop or maybe we are referring to the bishop or we are referring to some structure of a synod like we are sitting here. But we are the people of God and we are all called to be disciples and followers of Jesus. So it is about how we can be as a total as people of God and how we can live that out. But we need to be equipped for that. Because sometimes we have taken it for granted when people come in our doors in the churches, we think they know it. It's not. This is why the term intentional comes out in here. It's about how we become intentional both in the way we live but also in the way we equip others and we equip ourselves. So this is the work that is going on in terms of the communion and that's a small group of people that includes of course Bishop John and thank you for the contribution that comes out of the work here uh, within Canada but that's a small group that is currently uh, supporting this work. And I um, don't want to labor much on this but simply to say 
this journey is, uh, is ongoing. Uh, there are many ways in which as an office we resource diocese and provinces and we are happy to support that. There are various other bodies and, 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 and organizations that have got resources and are able to do that. I just want to highlight that uh, I left, I've come with a couple of resources. You may find them uh, just out beyond those doors if you are interested, but a lot of that resource also is available online and translated in, in, Jap in, uh, in Chinese, translated in Portuguese, in French, and Spanish. And so uh, if you are, uh, Bishop Jen is there, you, you can uh, no doubt, if you are interested, please contact her. Or I'm, I'm very happy to be contacted as well. But thank you for the opportunity to report on this. I appreciate it. Thanks very much for listening to us, and we have a, a gift for John Franker. and as uh, John said, please don't hesitate to ask any of us anything about ACC, and especially about Jesus-shaped uh, life. Thank you. to invite uh, ASIP to come to the presentation stage for an acceptance of the, the apology that the primate made for spiritual harm. And while they're making their way to the stage, I would just like to report to you that the fund, the, the special uh, offering that we have been receiving for PWRDF in, in honor of the primate, is right now at $4,890. And I happen to have a few extra envelopes. Is there somebody here who hasn't uh, donated yet and wants to raise that to a nice round number? Thank you very much. When it became clear that the primate was going to issue an apology, uh, we convened a group of elders who um, were here, and we knew that we're going to be here. Uh, we also included Laverne Jacobs, who has been uh, one of our most important elders for a number of years. Um, he was CC'd on this, and we have put together a response to the primate's apology, and we would like to um, acquaint you with that at this time. We, the Indonesian elders of General Senate 2019, humbly received the apology for spiritual harm containing the church commitment for spiritual healing. We commit to the conveying your grace, loving, thoughtful words to the Anglican Council of Indonesian people for the consideration and sharing with our communities. Let us say a first of all, that we know the church understands that healing and forgiveness is so deeply personal and is usually a journey, a process, nothing, not a single act. We cannot speak for those who were spiritually harmed by the church approach to colonization, each individual and each community across this vast land was heard different experience and, and is that different stage in healing process. But we, the elders of General Senate 2019, believe, believe that your words of apology will be support this healing process. We understand and respect in deeply meaning of this apology and the commitment and, and honor 
with which was made. Those of us who have had a pleasure to work with and to know your grace appreciate it, appreciate beyond the word can convey it. That you have heard and understood us. We are touched to the death of our soul by your words and commitment. We must clarify, however, that no single statement of except, except, except is possible on behalf of indigenous people in this land. We respect right for each individual and ponder to ponder your words, and we hope that those who are at the stage of their healing to accept and forgive will do so in privacy of their homes and community. Trauma can easily to reunite by the simple cues in day-to-day -day life, anger, despair, hurts, and humiliation can easily reappear often without warning, even when we have embraced the forgiveness. But, but we sincerely hope that your word provide comfort and help convey God's grace and love to those who are affected by the spiritual harm and by the church the role of creating this harm. For its part, we are sure that the Anglican Council of Indigenous Peoples will want to share this good news document that embraces what God created that what God created us to be. The Indigenous Council can be a bridge in disseminating this document within our Indigenous nations and sharing the love with which it was delivered. This is an historic week in the life of the future of our church. We did it together. We are partners in change. It was our finest moment as a church. As a fully recognized, self-determining people within the Anglican Church of Canada, the apology is timely in reinforcing that the church is walking side by side with us as we continue our spiritual journey for healing. We now ask that the Council of General Synod and the House of Bishops continue in your commitment to our journey of spiritual renewal and to being champions of change. We need you to strengthen your partnership with our Indigenous Archbishop. We must move forward together to demonstrate that restoration of our spiritual practices to their rightful and proper place in the church can only strengthen Anglican discipleship across Canada. We want to share a reflection now by Elder Grace Delaney on the personal depth and the meaning of your words of apology. First, I just wanted to crawl into bed and cry myself to sleep. I wanted to cry for those who have passed on, who have not had the opportunity to hear the primate's beautiful words of apology for spiritual harm. I wish that they had known that their pain was not in vain. Though they rest in peace and are in perpetual light, I can help. I can't help but rejoice for them too. There have been many, including indigenous people who have responded to the call to carry the word of the gospel of our creator and have worked hard to spread the gospel among our people. There are those among our people who, though Christian, 
completely reject their own values and systems of their traditional heritage. And there are those with courage who have stood and are standing up openly in the face of criticism and anger. They have be beheld the yearning of our Savior's heart, our previous primate Michael Pierce, our current primate Fred Hiltz, and many others across this temporary earthly home of ours defend their belief in justice and reconciliation. Across this land, many have felt remorse and even shame and have chosen to change the tides of the form, former norms of our church. Now our primate takes a step to reiterate in word the thoughts of hearts. An apology that can help build bridges and help us be the way our creator has intended for each of, a, of his diverse people. Each nation can now be true to the way creator God intended and fulfill their true destiny. They do not have to choose between their God and their culture. I feel such strength and release in the words of our primate's apology. It couldn't have come at a better time. Many of our people, young and old, have not found their identity and are caught in a chaotic state, not being able to figure out that the real me. I truly believe that if our creator made us different in color, in customs and cultures, then there really is a purpose and reason for each one of us, both diverse and collective, to see one another in the image of our triune creator. This is a moment to recognize that the courage that has been displayed in this apology has come from one greater and stronger and more powerful than our primate. There have been great orators throughout the history of humanity, and we were given Fred Hiltz. In part of our gospel reading for July 7th, Luke 10, 17 to 21a, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Our Lord responds, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy, through the Holy Spirit said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. It is in that same Holy Spirit that I thank you, your grace. Thank you for listening, all my relations. We thank you for your courage, for your eloquent apology, and for truly listening to the compassion of our Lord's heart to accept us as your brothers and your sisters with love. In our Creator's love and peace, we welcome your words of apology. Thank you. May our Creator God always be with us.
Thank you. Okay. Um, Peter has three little announcements, he says, and then we have two, two more short pieces of business. Hang in there. I promise these are the last. I really <laughs> do. Um, there's a box outside the hall for clickers. You don't need to find the office. Just put your clicker in the box with the other clickers. Its cousins are welcoming it. Um, the wonderful, wonderful creations of Thomas Roach have, have uh, delighted our hearts and have filled this space. And you will see them at the cathedral. The pieces that are here, including some of the pieces that are attached at the front, um, if, it, if you have created them, you are welcome to take them with you. If you would like to look at them, you're welcome to do so and take them with you. Uh, if they are not taken, they will be recycled, so don't worry about them, uh, about what's going to happen to them. They're beautiful, and we want to thank the people of the Synod who did this work, all these pieces at the front, because they really have made a difference. Don't forget your dinner tickets tonight. Um, yes, everybody says, oh God, where is it? Um, it started out in your white envelope. I can't speak beyond where it started out. But uh, you, need to, you need to bring your dinner tickets with you because you wouldn't want to get there and not get there, as it were. Um, so please remember to bring your tickets with you. And uh, from me uh, to the people over here, uh, a huge thank you for uh, all your help and all your patience. Thank you, Peter. I uh, would now call upon our private elect, uh, shipman Linda Nichols to say a few words. Soon to be Archbishop Linda Nichols. Thank you. I hate roller coasters, but I'm on one right now. <laughs> Thank you for the trust that you've placed in me by your election. I have been called by name, and my most important name, and one that I often refer to, is that of being baptized. Because it is out of that that each one of us serves. But I will have to grow into one of the many versions of that name, which is that of primate. I do that with great thanksgiving for those that have been my mentors over the years, I would like to say a very special thanks to two dioceses here. First is the Diocese of Toronto, the diocese where I served as a layperson, as a deacon, as a priest, and as a suffragan bishop. Formed me in so many ways in ministry, in the parishes of St. Paul's Lamoureux, parish of Georgina, the parish of Holy Trinity Thornhill. And my new home diocese in Huron, who in three years have made me incredibly at home. And for their love and care for somebody who didn't come from there. <laughs> and who have been teaching me. I am also deeply aware that I am the first woman to hold this office in this country. And I stand on the shoulders of many, many women who served as deaconesses, as lay readers, as the members of the Women's Auxiliary in the ACW, as rector's wardens and people's wardens, and eventually, when permitted, as deacons and priests. And I rejoiced at being at the election of the first woman bishop in Canada. And so I stand very much 
in honor and debt to them. Now, if I had a half hour, I would go on and on and on about the things that we have enjoyed in this synod. But I think we have somewhere to be. I do want to point out a couple of things that stood out to me. One was that wonderful Coast Salish welcome we had that pronounced ice, peace, be upon this synod. And I hope and pray we will leave with those word, that word in our hearts. That in spite of the roller coaster of both pain and joy we've experienced, as we've walked with one another, that we will go renewed in our commitment to serve this beloved church. I have to say a thank you, of course, to Fred, who I promise you is taking those shoes with him. <laughs> because there's no way that anyone could fill them. I just asked Fred if you'd let me be on speed dial. He's taking his phone with him too. <laughs> there will be other opportunities to talk about the things that we have decided here and that with the Council of General Synod, I will work with. I am deeply grateful to our indigenous peoples who welcomed me last night into their midst to begin conversation, to get to know one another and I look forward to the work on self-determination, the work of the Jubilee Commission, and the living out of what we've begun over many years and have seen the fruits of today and in this synod. There are so many other motions that will require us to look deep into discipleship, into climate change, into our relationships with others, and that's for another day. Each morning when I wake up, I, I open my phone and look at what has been sent by the Society of St. John the Evangelist. They have a daily short prayer or comment to send to those who know them. And I thought today's was particularly apropos, not only for me, but for all of us. And so let me conclude by reading it. Brother David Reihoff writes, give your strength to God and let God's strength be joined with yours to accomplish God's work in the world. Ask for God's help every day. Apart from me, Jesus said to his disciples, you can do nothing. So may we go in the strength of God. May we go to carry out all the work that has been laid before us in this synod. May we go with the strength of God into what faces us at home. Some will face pain, some will face joy, some will face uncertainty. But we go with God and with the care and strength and guidance of the Holy Spirit, we will be able to do what God has called us to do. Thank you. Know your name as one called by God. Thank you. Miigwech.
I direct your attention to the presentation stage. First of all, I want to uh, share with all of you that I had a wonderful visit with uh, Archbishop Melissa Skelton over the lunch hour. She's in good form. She's been following all of the proceedings of General Synod, assuring us of her love and prayers and faithful accompaniment. She's in pretty good form. And uh, she, she told me I had permission to tell you that she's been through every test and examination in the book, and they, they don't see anything wrong with her. So um, she's just sitting there waiting for a word of discharge. And, um, uh, but in very good form, and uh, we rejoice in that, of course. Time simply doesn't permit us in this uh, hour to uh, uh, express all the kind of thanks uh, that we feel in our hearts for so many who've supported the life and work of the 42nd session of the General Synod. And I, I would love to have had time to thank, in a very deep and personal way, uh, all of the people who've supported us our prolocutor, uh, Cynthia Haynes-Turner, our General Secretary, Michael Thompson, our, our Chancellor, um, David Jones, Peter Wall, and all of the work of the planning team for the Synod, uh, Michael's staff, Shannon, Josie, and Michelle, Heidi Wilker from Blessed Events, our worship team led by Peter Elliott, and a host of magnificent musicians, our chaplains, uh, the team led by Donna Ball, our Anglican video crew, Lisa and Ben and Carl and Patrick, uh, so much work you've done uh, to enable us to be able to move through our proceedings with such efficiency. Thank you so much. And all of the technical support team, and there's a cameraman that's been, he's been on the floor more than he's been standing. Uh, he's the most agile person in the room. I don't know what his name is, but he's a pretty smart guy. He just crawls around the front of the room and down the sides and he's getting all kinds of amazing pictures uh, of the Synod. Thank you, members of Synod. You have worked hard. And together we have made some momentous decisions that impact the life of our church. Our challenge now is to take the story of this synod back home, back into our dioceses and our parishes. The last word for this synod cannot and it must not be mine. It must be Jesus' word. Would you stand as we hear him speak? Hear the words of our Lord Jesus, sitting with his disciples in that upper room on the eve of his passion, his death, and glorious resurrection. Hear what he said to them, and hear afresh what he says to us. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. 
I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. And I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Let us join hands in our table groups. And even as we leave this place, let us greet one another. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. The 42nd session of the General Synod of the Anglican Church of Canada is prorogued. Go in peace, love and serve the Lord. <laughs>